It was built to be fluent, not factual, which again is a good conversation to have with our students because maybe there's a shortcut we can take to use this tool to say like, tell me, give me some context for this or help me understand this piece. But then you have to be really disciplined to come back and say, are those actually facts that can be proven? Welcome, everybody, to episode 63 of Cap and Gown. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources. Matt, I'm so glad you joined me today. It's great to be with you. This is your first Cap and Gown of the Year, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. I was solo last week and it was a little bit rough. Did you <laughs> notice that Trey put hearts in our countdown music? Because it's Valentine's, it is Valentine's Day. Day. So that was so good. So that's pretty awesome. Um, I was trying to think before we started what some of the chit chat was. Honestly, I'm so preoccupied with our topic today. I have been like immersed in it for a week. I've read like 70 articles on this deal. And so yeah. I'm having a little bit of a difficulty with the chit chat part. <laughs> and I would say, Rachel, I, I don't know that I've, I mean, you love to dive in on a topic, but I don't know that I've ever seen you really get in like this. I mean, you've done yeah. a lot of reading, a lot of research. Yes. Okay. So, but I do have a couple of fun things to tell you about. So we have, first of all, Shauna uh, Neal is in Florida for a conference right now. So if you are joining us from the CCCU conference, look her up. She would love to spend time with you. Also, we have a couple of other, besides our client stuff that we're doing with texting and spotlight sessions next week, I told you last week about Sherry's uh, Sky Factor webinar about what's happening with our student affairs employees' experiences. Love for you to join that. I think it's going to be really powerful. Um, and then we also have two other conferences that are coming up. One of them uh, is with Dave Roseboom, who is the VP for student development at Mars Hill. I love him. This is going to be super helpful. This is through the Appalachian uh, College Association. Please join us for that as we talk about high impact student retention plans. And then our next one is with the North Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities talking about the journey of implementing holistic student success. So those are both going to be really, really fun. I'm looking forward to them. Love for you to join us. You know, we're just always trying to give you the content you need to be successful. So any right. other chit chat that you have on your list? Uh, no, I, I, well, we just had a spark meeting today with uh, Rose Boom. Nice. And Lisa. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. But, uh, so, yeah. Okay. Well, then you know what it's time for. Fancy that is. I'm, yeah. I'm saying, Rachel, Trace has got, got some a production quality going on around here. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, okay. What so is me, the State of the Union? Yeah, let me tell you the State of the Union. First of all, I love this one so much. This is about how academia needs more deadlines. Um, which is really interesting because there's been sort of this conversation about how fewer deadlines are more helpful. They're more sort of gracious to students. They understand that things are happening in their lives and they might not be able to focus on all your little deadlines like as you go through the semester. But this research actually is saying that um, short, numerous short-term deadlines are really helpful to our students because first of all, let's remember they're college students. So their self-monitoring and their self-regulation skills are still developing. So that's one piece is they're like, oh, I can just wait for a while. And this article is saying, no, that you're actually not doing them a favor when you do that. Right. Um, also, a really hard part about college is that it has ample unstructured time, distractions, and far off deadlines, which this study says are some key factors in a procrastination friendly environment, which sounds very attractive to me, but not the best way to get things done, right? right. Um, also, though, they talk about this in, for non traditional students as well that. Although it can be really stressful to have to turn in things throughout the semester and hit multiple de deadlines, this faculty member said, hey, current you feels like all these deadlines are annoying, but future you is going to be so happy to not have that mad scramble at the end. 
And I was thinking about this. Obviously, there are caveats to this. Like there are some people that are not going to do well. We do have to have flexible schedules. But I was thinking about, you remember we talked to the, the campus that had a very, very flexible online schedule for students. And they were they were like, you can take three hours or you can take 12 hours. You can stop out. You can come back. We don't know how long it's going to take you. And they had never had somebody successfully complete the course. Yeah. And finally, they're like, you have to take at least uh, nine hours every semester. It's going to take you two years. You're going to move through this way. And then all of a sudden, the students start being really, really successful. So I, you just need that scaffolding, right? And somebody to hold you accountable because those huge projects, I'm thinking about like your marketing project, right? Where it's like a huge project. That's where I went. I was so, I mean, it was a huge project and it was like a culmination of the entire semester. And at the end it was, you know, students would write 60 to 80 pages on a, a full marketing uh, breakdown for, for a product. And what I found was just having the, the final deadline, it was so brutal for them. And so we started to have these little checkpoints. Yeah. I want you to have this finished and at this date. And, and I really, um, saw a lot more success with my students, you know, completing yeah. it. So I think it's a great example of, we just have yeah. to have that sort of uh, teach them how to manage their time. Yeah. Okay. The next one is about, I, I feel like we've talked about this before, but this is so practical. This is about advisors for returning adult students. So, you know, we've been talking about the population of students is yes, traditional, but we have a huge population of adult returners. And this article out of Inside Higher Ed is all about how you should have specialized advisors to help these students because they have so many different things um, that they're dealing with as opposed to a traditional student. One of the things that I thought was so interesting is they're like abrupt changes to childcare arrangements and the shuffling of the daily routine is something that adult learners are managing all the time. And so your advisor needs to have some expertise in how can we move things around so that you can still be successful? Can you join that class hybrid? Can you listen to the video later, right? But that's a really big piece of helping those students. Also things like financial aid, um, living with children that where they're economically precarious, um, all of those different elements of helping a student who has so many things on their plate navigate a degree successfully. So this article talks about Sometimes you have to advise a student that you should move from a credit bearing degree to a non-credit certificate, right? So like these micro, um, what do they call it? Micro, I forget what it's called. Micro something. Um, credentialing, right? Yeah. So that you could get this credential and do a job and then improve and then improve and then improve. So they have a great example of their pre-nursing sequence for non-traditional students is that they get a CNA first which is a short term, it's like an associate's degree. And then they can work with that. And then they come back and they get the next thing, which is their LPN. And then they can get a different kind of job with that. And then they come back and they get their RN. So it's just like this very sequential piece. What's interesting is for the school, the on-time graduation numbers are not great if you set up your um, process like that, but it's the right way to get these non-traditional adult students through. And you have to have some expertise in that. So I love that. I just think it's fantastic. And, mm -hmm. and especially as universities are trying to attract the, the adult learners, as we're looking at the, the enrollment cliff that's coming, that the way to do that is not just to enroll them, but to craft have all expertise. of these. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Okay, a really interesting article on why students are so engaged. This came out of the State of the Student 2022 survey by the academic publishing company Wiley. Um, they surveyed about 5,000 students and about 2,500 instructors in North America in August of 2022. 55% um, of undergraduate students and 38% of graduate students said they struggled to remain interested in their classes. Um, and the same proportion of undergraduates and then 34% of graduate students said they have trouble retaining the material they learn. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty big population. Uh, what's really interesting about this article is that one of the things that students identified that would help them is relating the data or the, the classes more closely to their future careers. So real world applications, experiential learning, 
81% of students said it's important or very important for institutions to incorporate company-led projects to mimic real work, which you and I love this. In fact, yeah. the reason you weren't with me last week at Cap and Gown is because you were leading a project um, at Abilene Christian University for a group of students who's going to be doing this, this really helpful um, yeah. technology project for us, right? So... This article talks about the difficulty for faculty. You have to have the right contacts. You have to have people that you can call on that will say like, yes, we would love for, to have students in our space. But also one of the struggles is like for you and me, it's very hard to find time to manage that group of students and to stay engaged with them because we have so many things happening. So it's kind of this dance between faculty, students, and then the industry professionals to try and create that piece, right? Um, the rest of that article is nothing surprising to us. It's all about mental health challenges that are facing our students. This is not anything new for us, but I love that idea of real work, real world projects, because I think it takes it out of this sort of theoretical piece and really says like, hey, you have to work on a team in the real world. And so you have to learn how to do that well, right? You have to learn how to manage projects. It's not just like, let's talk about how you would manage projects. Anything you want to add to that one? No, I just think it's fantastic. It's one of the reasons why I love being in Abilene is there's three universities and we get to tap in uh, and help them. And you really see it start to click. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a great model. Okay. Um, also, I have this article from Higher Ed Dive, which is called What Can Work Colleges Teach the Rest of Higher Ed? Matt, you and I love work colleges. I think there's 10 institutions in the United States um, they were qualified as a work college. That is not about um, like work study. This is a totally different thing. These are institutions that are nonprofit, offer four-year degrees, and provide students with employment through a work learning service program that contributes to their education. So for example, if a student's studying ecology, then they get a job managing the science lab on campus. Or they apply for another job that kind of reinforces what they're already learning about. So what's really interesting is they take Sterling as an example. Sterling's in Northern Vermont. Um, they say every semester students apply for a different job. And sometimes it takes them five jobs to find the one that they're like, oh, I love this. I would do this all the time, which talk about real world experience, right? right. You think you want to do a thing, try it on for a semester and then go, mm, no, I don't actually want to do that. The other amazing thing about work colleges is that, like at Sterling, tuition is uh, $39,000 a year, but because the students work, they get tuition credit credits that go directly to their bill. So students pay between $1,000 and $3,500 a semester, depending on what jobs they have and how many hours awesome. they work, which is amazing. So in this article, they talk about adult learners and how that might work for them. It's a little bit trickier because these schools tend to be rural and really dependent on um, students that live on campus. So for adult learners, it's a little bit different. But the other hardship, which for our schools I love, is that these schools usually enroll under 1,000 students. So they're usually pretty small, but that's so conducive to community. Right. We're all working together like I'm working here for you and you're working here for me. And so it's a really powerful model. However, there's only seven thousand students currently enrolled in one of these work colleges. So, it's, right. yeah, right. So it's, I think, really powerful. But there are some challenges to that as well. And I don't well, know how you scale that. I just think the yeah. expectation of when you a, a part of being a college student or, or setting that expectation that you would also work on campus. Um, you know, my son's working as, as he's in his freshman year and, and the experience for him, the all the people that he's meeting, the kind of work that he's doing, it's outstanding. Yeah. So I, I just, I don't know how you scale it, but kind of <clears> setting <throat> that expectation of, and for a university really to find more um, roles, you know? Yeah, for sure. Well, I think we have, um, had dinner with some of those students several times and it's just such a great reflection of community and mm -hmm. the, the idea that like they belong at that college and the college belongs to them. It's like this mutual respect for each other. So yeah. I really love that. Okay. That is the state of the union. 
Except that I have to tell you that I kind of feel like the rest of our time together is a state of the union too. Because this subject that we're about to talk about is um, super relevant. If you pay attention to higher education news at all, you have seen about 300 articles about uh, chat GPT. So I want to start with what are we talking about? What are some of the concerns that are coming out of this? Um, I don't know what you call it. Like it's a website right now. Um, and then I want to talk about applications in higher education because this, you guys, I think is very similar to the sort of wave of COVID. I mean, it's not as it's not serious like that, but the wave of COVID where we were a little bit behind and students have known about this already since November. And I'm going to give you uh, I'll give you some um, statistics about how they're already using it. So it is on your campus. Students are using it. You probably don't know anything about it. Um, and so I want to give you the tools to be able to address it. Is that a fair setup for that, Matt? That's great. Yep. That's great. Okay. So first of all, um, I'm going to actually call it. So the one we're talking about right now is called Chat GPT. But this is really about AI assisted content creation. So there's a couple of different ones. This one just came out in November. It's the most powerful. It has the most money behind it right now. But everything we're going to be talking about is relevant for some of these other ones that I'm going to tell you about as well. Also, I cannot say, I don't know who named it chat GPT. Well, but it's generative pre-training. Yeah, That's I hate it. GPT. Okay, so we're just going to talk about AI content creation. Okay, but that's what I mean. Great. So this is basically where you type in a prompt and this bot responds in an appropriate voice. So you can say, hey, this is for a college class or explain it like a 12 year old needs to understand it or whatever. OK, so it's from a company called OpenAI that started in like 2015 with a really powerful board of directors. They raised a lot of money. They were like, AI is so important to the future of humanity that it must be a nonprofit company because we wouldn't want for a company whose eye is on their shareholders to be in charge of what we do with AI. Well, then they started like understanding the power of it and they're like, never mind, we want to make money, we're taking it back. Okay. So Microsoft, this I think last month pledged $10 billion to this project, giving them 49% holding of it. It's a $29 billion value of the valuation of the company. That's crazy. Um, DeepMind is Alphabet's version. Thank you, Alphabet, for naming it DeepMind, because that's one I would like to say, right? <laughs> and Bard, like Shakespeare the Bard, is Google's AI chatbot. They're a little bit behind, but both of those. So we have Facebook, Google, and Microsoft is in on the chat GPT. Okay. Created years ago by Sam Altman, who's a Stanford dropout. It was launched in November. It is the fastest growing consumer app in history. It uses uh, 175 billion language parameters, making it one of the most, uh, one of the largest and most powerful AI language models ever. So that's how they trained it. They took 175 billion language param parameters and just started teaching it how to do these responses. Um, hashtag. Uh, Chat GPT has surpassed over half a billion views on TikTok. One of the interesting things about it is that it's free right now, but that you are using your labor to actually teach it things it needs to know. So you can engage with it. You can say, tell me this. And then it tells you and you say, that doesn't seem exactly right. What about this? So it's constantly learning, right? So one of the really big things for higher education is um, students using their time and their work to perfect this robot, for lack of a better word, to then eventually um, take over some people's jobs, like this is a really big concern that now all of a sudden you're going to have this AI that can do this. So a quote, you're helping the robots by giving them exactly what they need in order to create better models that came out of this uh, director for the fight for the future. Um, and you should assume that everything you put in the model is accessible. 
So there's some trustworthy issues there. Um, you want to make sure that you're not putting in like trade secrets because they are going to live in a place and you can't delete it. Uh, you, you can delete your account, but you can't delete what it what you've taught the AI right. piece. Um, two more like what is it questions. So first of all, it consistently if you put in a prompt, a prompt, faculty and teachers are saying it can consistently spit out between a C minus and a B paper. So it's just consolidating like here's I need this many words. Here's the prompt that I'm giving it. I'm in, you know, I'm a freshman and it will spit out a B paper. OK. Also in March, it's going to be um, integrated into Bing. So it's a huge thing for Microsoft, which now is competing with Google, obviously, because they are going to have this AI piece which what that means for searching is instead of searching and seeing a list of links that then you click into and you understand, and then you click into the next one, you understand, this is just going to spit out the answer. So it's a much quicker process for you to get a, an answer to the question. Does that make sense? Anything I yeah. missed about the foundation? I, I think that's a great setup. Okay. So we're talking about this right now, you guys, because Stanford from January 9th to January 15th, did a survey of students. They had four, uh, 4,400 respondents. Of those respondents, 17% of them said they used chat GPT to assist with their fall assignments. It just came out in November. Of those 17, a majority reported using it only for brainstorming and outlying, uh, right. outlining. Um, right. Only about 5% said that they submitted information directly from the AI tool with no edits. So that's iffy, right? This is like telling yourself, I don't know about that. Um, I also have this article about another uh, survey where they said um, they asked a bunch of students what was going on with them. So let's see. One in three college students are a, who are aware of this AI tool. One in three college students who are aware of this AI tool, let it complete writing assignments for them. What may be shocking to campus leaders is that three quarters of those users believe that using the technology constitutes cheating. So a lot of them are like, we know it's cheating. We definitely have done it, but we know it's cheating. Um, 60 60% of them said they rely on the tool for 50% or more of their writing assignments. And one in four students believe their professor doesn't know that this tool exists. So they're like under the wire. They're using it for a lot of assignments if they know about it. Um, but they, so universities are behind, I guess, is my summary of that. Um, so a lot of campuses are using, or students on campuses are using this tool um, to, to cheat, basically. Which is why this is such an important topic for us right now. Yes, exactly. So I want to start with the um, security and trustworthy issues, because I think, Matt, as I was trying to frame this conversation for us, um, I was talking to Jaretta about this yesterday, and she's like, you know, there's always two camps. There's like don't use the new technology because we don't like it. Or there is, well, I guess that exists How do now. We embrace it? Yeah. Right. And so we just are going to have to figure out what to do about it. And so this issue of trustworthiness and security, I think is a, a great place to start with students to have a conversation about it. Because, I mean, you've been sitting next to me as I've been talking about this for <laughs> a while. And even some of the things that I'm uncovering about, like, is it accurate? The answer is no. It is not accurate. Uh, so I want to give you some information to kind of fuel your conversation with students and with your faculty and other campus leaders, because this is we really are on the leading uh, edge of this. All right. First of all, in order to sign up for an account, you have to use an open AI account, which you have to provide with an email address, your Google account information and a cell phone number. Okay, so that's the very first thing. And the privacy policy of OpenAI says that they will share this information to third parties, law enforcement affiliates, and data can be visible to other users in a way that's very broad. 
right? So we kind of are used to this. You and I have talked before about how our students are like, yeah, everybody knows everything about us. There is no security. There is no privacy, right? Um, but it is an important starting point of like, what are you giving up when you decide to use this piece? Because not only can they see identifying information, but they're also watching what you ask and how you train it and, and the things that you're saying on it. Okay. So that's, yeah. the I mean, you learn a lot about a person just based on what they're putting in. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, it is illegal for this tool to be used by children under 13 because it violates the children's online privacy protection rule. Um, but a lot of the research is saying that, that even through K, in K-12, they're seeing students use this as well. So it's technically illegal, but students are, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, you can request that your account be deleted. However, they are not going to delete any of your content. So they can disassociate you from that and say like, okay, forget about you, you, you don't exist in our system anymore, but everything that you've done to teach the AI bot is still going to exist. They're not going to then erase all of that. Yeah. I think that's a really important part of this is that they spent all of this time training it with all of this information for up to, what'd you say? 2021. Yeah. But, but now all the prompts and all the, the things that you're putting in, it's teaching it more. And exactly. so you can't, you can't unwind what you put into it. And if we think about it in terms of, like I said before, like you're teaching it, but it's, it is eventually going to, you're going to have to pay for it or they're going to monetize it some way. So they're using your labor. It's almost like Wikipedia, except then if somebody owned Wikipedia, right? Like everybody right. puts in and like edits and does all the stuff and like keeps it up to date and all that stuff. But then a company comes in and is like, okay, now I own all of your work. And related, it can have biases, right? So depending on who's training it and what of those language prompts they used, um, it can be biased against certain things just because it looked at bad data to start. So those are all kind of concerning. Actually, not kind of. Those are all concerning <laughs> things to me. Um, but here's one that I think is a great talking point for our faculty and for students this chat, this chat G -G GPT is not trustworthy. And here's what I mean by that. The goal of this engagement is not to write things that are true, but to write things that are plausible. So you're not fact checking. You're not like, okay, what's your source? What's your source? What's your source? You're not doing that. It's just trying to tell you something that seems like, yeah, I'd buy that. When it doesn't know something, it actually makes something up. <laughs> so it literally is like, oh, I wasn't trained on that. I'm just going to spit out something that <clears throat> I think you'll buy, right? I have a, I have a great example of that where I, where I asked uh, Chat GPT about um, Enneagram and how, how different Enneagram uh, types would react to, or what's the benefit of chat GPT by Enneagram type. And, and it says that a, an Enneagram two would really like it because of the empathy and, and emotional support that it provides. To which and one thing it definitely does not do is have empathy or emotional support. Like <laughs> that's in all of these articles. It does not do that, but it's plausible. Yeah. I mean, that is why a two would like it if it could provide that. Right. Right. So it knows something about Enneagram. Right. And it's so, Oh, there's nine types and yada, yada. Oh. And so if I were to be liked by twos, this is what they would want. Right. And so it just says that it can do it. But then I said, what are, what are some of the limitations, limitations of uh chat G PT. Um, and the number one limitation is emotional support and empathy. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just trying it's to train. It's trying. They, they have a lot of, uh, <laughs> there's a couple of articles where it's like the AI has been found to confidently rattle off false answers about basic <laughs> math, physics, and measurement. I told you, I read an article where this guy asked for a haiku about something, and then it got the wrong number of syllables. And I think that's a really, really important place to camp out on because that is a in the time measurable mistake. I know how many syllables a haiku is supposed to have. You told me this is a haiku. I count the syllables and I'm like, no, that's not true. But 
I also said, tell me something interesting about college students. And they said, 40% of college students have slept through a class. And I said, what was your source? You guys, this AI makes up references too. So when you try to fact check it, it will say, oh, it's from this study, blah, 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 blah. You go to Google and maybe that study exists, but it has nothing to do with what it just told you. So it's slippery. <laughs> it's, right. it's, it was built to be fluent, not factual, which again is a good conversation to have with our students because maybe there's a shortcut we can take to use this tool to say, like, tell me, give me some context for this or help me understand this piece. But then you have to be really disciplined to come back and say, are those actually facts that can be proven, right? Yeah, I, I love the way you set that up. I mean, this is this is everything that you just said. You lay that out. It starts a great conversation with your students because, you know, they need to understand this, but also start thinking critically about not, you know, not just taking the answers that are spit out, but thinking through them. How would you know whether or not this is factual? Right. Right. So it's a good starting point in conversation with students. Yeah. It, I, it is it, so different. Right. So they used to say, well, you're not always going to have a calculator in your pocket. You need to learn how to do math. Right. And now we all have calculators in our phone. But uh, the difference here is that with a calculator, you knew it was going to be math. Like it's a fact, right answer. Yeah. It wasn't like 80% of the time it would give you the right number. You just trust that this, this math is going to be accurate. Well, with this thing so far, I mean, it can improve, but yeah, right now you can't trust it. So you, you have to use your critical thinking, be able to suss through like it. Is that, like you said, it, it's plausible, but is it factual? Right. right. Yes, exactly. Um, okay. And then the other kind of downfall of this, we've addressed this kind of, but that it lacks emotional intelligence, common sense, empathy. Common sense is crazy town. It's like, I, I can't even give you the examples of like, ask a common sense question and it looks through all of its stuff. And it's like, I don't, I, I don't know the answer to that because it didn't exist in the literature that I read. Right. Um, empathy, creative solutions, personal advice, and it refuses to answer medical or legal advice. However, there are a lot of articles about uh, experiments that they did like offline <clears throat> where this AI diagnosed as well as a doctor and passed the bar exam uh, for a lawyer. So there's a lot of examples that it can do those things. It's just obviously they have to have like, don't, you need to go see your doctor. Don't ask me about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I want to talk about, I think when we're thinking about this, when I first heard about it, I was kind of bored because I'm like, how many times? So I was thinking that you remember a couple months ago, I was telling you about the, what is the app that's like approximates counseling or it's like, how do you feel? I feel fine. Tell oh, me right. more about that. Right. And it's just all reflective. So I was pretty bored with it. But then as I started to dig in, so what we've talked mostly about, here's what it can do, okay? First of all, it can create an essay. So it can, in a particular voice, in a particular style, for a particular audience, create an essay. And what this means is that the college essay is going to fast become a, a historical artifact, right? Where anybody can just say, I need an essay on blah, 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 blah. Here you go. So we have to figure out some ways to, to do a different kind of learning and teaching for our students. But that's something that this AI tool is going to be really good at. And I suspect is how most students are using it right now. Oh, okay. sure. it, can, it can write poems. Um, it can write emails. So I actually said, um, write me an email to a student who is struggling in class, asking them to come and see me. So it wrote an email, dear student, I noticed you're struggling, blah, 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 blah. Really interesting, right? So it can write an email. There are a lot of articles about people who are not good at written communication using this intelligence to write an article, write an article to my insurance, uh, sorry, write an email to my insurance uh, company asking them to lower my deductible. Okay, 
I can do that. Right. Um, really outsourcing sort of like a personal assistant that it would be able to do this written communication for you. It can create learning objectives and ask questions about a text. So they have a lot of teachers who are dropping, let's say, um, textbook information in and then saying, will you please generate a learning uh, objective for me? Here's what students should know by the time that they read this. Super helpful, really interesting. It can create quizzes for you. So you could do self quizzes or you can create a quiz for your class. Um, it can provide feedback about a text or not a text, text. So you drop text in and it's like this sentence would be better like this. This sounds very informal. You maybe need to blah, 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 blah. So it can give you feedback about that. Um, and then I have this huge list, you guys. This uh, group of slides by Tori Trust, who is in the College of Education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She has a whole slide deck of like everything you need to know about chat GPT. So we're going to um, share that with you. She has a list of 20 things that this AI tool can do for faculty, writing their syllabus, creating their lecture notes, giving them assessment tools, um, research proposals, grant applications, study materials for students student support materials, study guides, like the list goes on and on about all of the ways that a faculty member would be able to use this piece. Student progress reports, academic advising materials. You basically just go and say, here's what I need for my class. And it's like, here you go, right? So here's part of the friction where teachers are feeling a little bit anxious about teaching this AI how to do what they do and saying like, oh, no, those aren't good learning objectives. We need that to be a little bit different. Or I would do this. Or here's a more critical thinking question. Because, again, you're teaching it to get better and better and better. And eventually it's going to do a teacher's job. It's not. But you can understand how people would be nervous about this ability for it to just do all the things. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say something about the grant application. Because that, to me, is such a nice uh, way to use this. AI. Yeah, I just I just threw my stack of of uh, its response. So let's just say hypothetically, you want to apply for a Title V grant. You're a Hispanic serving institution, and you're wanting to apply for a grant. Uh, I just put that prompt in, and and I said I need three thousand words, and it just went to work and organized it. And that's the thing that that I really like about it. Of course, you have to go through and you have to like make sure it's making sense and all that. What I like is the shortcut that it provides in a logical outline. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, it, it generated a 3000 word uh, grant application for me, you know. Right. Which then obviously, because we know it's not always right and we need to go back and we need to change it. And if we come back to the, like, it writes like a B, a, like a, it, you get a B on that grant, right? But the shortcut of all of the facts and the structure and the outline and all of that kind of stuff is where that would be really, really useful as opposed I mean, to looking at a blank page and like, oh, my gosh, I have to start from nothing. Right. For a, yeah. For a month. I mean, you, you could spend a month pulling and organizing and putting together your outline and and then you have to get to work on writing it. And I just sat down and and put a little paragraph in. And next thing you know. I've got this application. Yeah. I don't know. Um, two other applications of this are, um, it's being used a lot on campuses for coding so that you can just say, I need a code that's going to do this thing and it will spit it out. Um, but again, it's not always factual. So actually GitHub said, we don't want any more code coming out of chat GPT because it's not good. It's not good yeah. code. Right. Yeah. But every time you correct it, you're like, oh, that didn't do it here. Let me fix it for you. And you feed it back in. Then now it has that new skill. Um, OK, so I hope that is a <laughs> sufficient introduction to the power of this tool. I cannot tell you how many articles I'm reading about the AI revolution like the industrial revolution, like the, the internet re revolution, that this is going to be a new piece. And so I want to do some critical thinking about how 
this is going to change what we're doing in higher education. Um, the first thing, like any of these tools, is it's not going to go away. It's only going to become more powerful and more ubiquitous. Like, right? Like, 17% of students have used it since it came out in November, but that is constantly growing. I, I told you, it's the fastest growing app um, in the store. I mean, let's just stop on when Microsoft started their partnership with OpenAI, they put in a billion dollars. Right. And they just put in another Ten. estimated $10 billion. Yeah. So it's not going to go away. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think we have to be in the camp. It's so, it reminds me of when I was teaching a first year seminar course. And the big thing we had to overcome was how finding good sources through Google, right? Like, yeah. hey, students, you can't just type in a thing and then whatever Google says back, that's, those are facts. You need to look at, is this an academic source? Who, like, where is it coming from, right? This is really similar um, because it's just spitting back this information. My struggle with this one is that because it is not transparent, it is not giving you sources, and sometimes it's making up sources, it is way harder for you to say, that's not a reliable source, that I will trust, right? right. That's coming out of this website, which I know does a good job. This website I, is like crazy town, right? So it is a really big problem that you won't get those uh, reference links. Also, Remember that this is based on a body of information that is a, so the way that this AI responds to you is a mirror to that information. It is not real. It is, it, it is going to have biases because of how it was created. And when you strip out the ability to see references then, and you put a company in charge of it that wants to make money. We have some really big conversations to have around that, right? For sure, yeah. Um, so I think that's something in higher education we're going to have to think about. But I do think it's going to prompt us to, to demonstrate our learning beyond exams and essays. There's a lot of conversation like if AI can, can produce an essay because there's so much already out there on the topic and it's good and it's sound and it's well-written, do we have to then do that? Or can we just take what they're doing and plus it, right? Say, how can we do something different or think about it differently or whatever? Um, so this idea of essays, it used to be you could ask a student to write an essay because of all of the stuff that had to happen beforehand. So it wasn't so much the content of the essay. It was you have to do your research. You have to synthesize that. You have to have critical thinking. You have to do all that stuff. The essay now has become stripped of all of that. And it's just writing about a thing that somebody's written about before. And so we have to come up with new ways to be able to, to test uh, students um, learning. One thing that is really interesting with this principle is that you can ask students to do things like create images, multimedia presentations, stand up and explain, right? Because that's then you have to have synthesized, even if you just read an article that the AI provides you, you have to be able to have deep understanding of it to be able to explain it to someone else. And we're going to have to move away from fact-based prompts to analytical reasoning prompts. Yeah. This deeper level of thinking that AI cannot do, we're going to have to change in higher education the way we're assessing that. Okay. Anything you want to say about that before I move on to cheating? Uh, no, I, I, I've got, I'll save it for later. Okay. So the other thing as we're thinking about how this is going to impact higher education, cheating is a huge piece. I've already told you that students are using this um, for essays. They know it's not a good idea, but they're doing it anyway. Um, there's two uh, innovations that have come out of since November. So the first one is that AI, OpenAI has an AI text classifier, which is sort of like... Um, Turn it in. Is that what it is? Turn it in. I think that's right. You know, your plagiarism software where you turn yeah. it in and then any, it's like, any plagiarism software. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, this is this exact sentence exists somewhere. Well, obviously with AI, it's it's trickier because it's not spitting back the same sentences, it's moving it all around. But they do have a classifier where you can drop text in and it will say, 
the likelihood that this was created by, by AI is X percent. The hardship for higher education is that you can't say you plagiarized, look, here's where you took it from. You can only say there's a 79% chance that you didn't actually write this. And so our um, academic dishonesty policies are going to have to have diff very different language. And I'll give you some examples of that. Also, this 22-year-old senior out of Princeton named Edward Tian uh, created GPT-0, which is the slogan of that is that humans deserve truth. And so it is really similar to the um, classifier where you drop in text, you can upload a file. So if you had a bunch of papers that a student that students have written, put them all on one page, you upload it, and then it will give you the, this sentence is likely to have been written by AI. Matt, I think it's so fascinating. His two scales, again, he can't say 100%, but he can give you a, a percentage on two scales. His first scale is called perplexity, which is how does AI respond to what you wrote? Because if it's familiar with it and it's seen it before, then it's not perplexing at all. It's like, oh yeah, this, this is this, right? But if it is original and it perplexes AI, then it's less likely to have been written by them, right? Because they don't have it in their vernacular. And you and I were talking about that's not going to work forever because as we're teaching it, it's going to get more and more familiar with different elements. Um, but then the I just other think it's hilarious. I mean, if you think about like, college students tend to write with perplexity, <laughs> right? A hundred percent. Yeah. That's why we always say, read it out loud. Can't tell yeah. you how many times somebody has sent me something and I'm like, will you just read that out loud? Because I don't know what it means. I don't know what you're actually saying to me. The other thing that he's measuring is burstiness, which is a big picture indicator that plots perplexity over time. And the idea here is that humans tend to be like, they, they tend to have in writing, they tend to have ideas and then they say things and then there's an idea and then they say things and then there's an idea. Whereas AI is programmed to be more consistent. It's like a constant um, voice of kind of all knowing this consistent. So they don't have these huge upticks First, in complexity. Yeah. And so that's the other thing he's measuring. So you can use that right now. This guy's about to graduate and he basically, I don't know what his plans were, but his plan now is to make this his full-time job because everybody is like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so helpful to us. So I think that's really helpful. Um, let's see. Can y'all tell Ra Rachel, man, such a deep dive on I'm this. I'm just trying to download all of this into your brains. I know we're going to have a lot more conversation about it, but I'm just trying to like get us acclimated to the idea of, of what exactly we're talking about. Okay. Okay, so a couple of other things for higher education. Are you making fun of me? Not at all. I'm so excited. Okay. Um, I really like what you said before about calculators and math. I think another analogy there would be like encyclopedias to Google, right? Like encyclopedias are hard and they exist a place. And then we're like, oh, everybody has it so easy now because they can just go and Google a thing. And we have gotten better and better about how we understand Google to work and the tools, and the fact that it is actually a great tool in higher education. It is the way we find things out. We search academic articles, right? We have literacy about what Google is and all of those different elements. I think this is really similar, but I will say a lot of the articles I read, one of them talked about how nobody, what did it say? It says, we have lost the will and maybe the ability to memorize phone numbers, right? Like, when I was in high school, I knew a hundred phone numbers. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I told you I got locked out the other day and I couldn't call you because I didn't know your phone number. I like knocked on the door of an office and I'm like, can I borrow your phone? And I dialed five different phone numbers because I don't know your phone number. I learned it after that. <laughs> but what's interesting about that is that is either an argument that we freed up our mind to think about more important things or that we are more reliant on technology. Like don't lose your phone because you will not be able to call anyone, yeah. right? So I think that that's a really interesting conversation to have with our students. Also, I think if we think about this as we want, communication is the goal, then this is just a tool. It's, communication is not always the goal. 
sometimes we are teaching and learning. Sometimes we do need to synthesize. But if you're just using this as a communication tool, it's really funny. I read this phrase called uh, hallmarkization, hallmarkization, yeah. which is like, hey, at least when you're loved one on Valentine's Day gives you a card, you know, they didn't write it, right? It's not like their idiosyncrasies. It's not their creativity. It's not their personality or their emotions. They picked it, but it didn't come from them, right? And so this is a really interesting conversation to say, if we type something into AI and it spits something back, does that mean it is kind of hallmark as eyes because you didn't do it? But if you come back and tweak it and change it and say, this is not exactly right. Here's the right nuance. Here's for my audience what I want to say to them. Is that a good way for students to use that as a communication tool? Yeah. Well, you know, with the card, they, they put in all the work to design and, and put the right message in. I don't know if you're like me, you know, I'll add a little extra note to it. Right. So yeah. in the same way with this, if you're just taking it as psh, that's the output and I'm just going to drop it in, then uh, not great. It's not you. Yeah. Okay. So you guys on the to-do list for uh, higher education, you are going to have to develop a standard protocol for dealing with AI plagiarized work that's flagged by these detectors. So the, just put that on your summer list, you guys. It is going to be a thing that we have got to get moving. Um, I found a great syllabus resource for you that I'm going to uh, send you a link for here. This is a like template for how you can assess AI tools and how you want to talk about them. So I was going to go over it, but it's there's so it's so meaty. It is going to be the perfect first step for you as you're thinking about what your new protocol is going to be. Please, it's the best resource that I have to offer you. So please use that awesome. one. I did want to tell you, so I, I looked at schools that have already put this in their syllabus. For example, using artificial intelligence to generate assignments or part of assignments is generally discouraged. If you choose to use an AI agent for generating portions or aspects of an assignment, you must disclose this and cite it in the same manner that you would any external source. There's a great example, right? You can use that as a tool, but you've got to tell us that you did it. You can't pretend like it's yours. Another one is the use of artificial intelligence to produce writing for this course is not allowed unless otherwise stated by the instructor. If a student is found to have used AI generated content for the assignment, the student will fail the assignment for the course. So you just have to think through really specifically what your policy is going to be. Um, and I would say an action item is you need an AI task force as if we don't have enough task force forces, force I, you need an AI task force that is going to talk about this revolution that is coming. It can't be a siloed conversation in one place on campus. You need to have multiple voices to be able to talk about, here's our stance. It's a tool. We don't want you to use it. We have some schools, uh, specifically K through 12s, I think in New York, they banned the site. So like they blocked it on all of their school computers. And then you have other faculty who are like, I'm going to teach you how to use this really well. It's going to save you some time and it's going to be a great resource for you. So you just have to have that conversation. I think people are going to handle that really differently. Okay. In our last time together, um, I want to give you some examples of how you can use this in the classroom. So one thing is... Interviews, surveys, experiments, and observations are practically impossible for AI to perform. So getting those elements, interviews, surveys, experiments, and observations related to our State of the Union article where people want to have experiential learning, right? Those are the kinds of things that you will be sure to be measuring students' actual learning, not this outcome of AI. You can require your students to submit unedited drafts, markups, and other material with their finished papers and ask them to explain their writing process. So thank you so much for this paper. But what I really want to get to is how did you do the research? How did you synthesize it? Where were the places where you had difficulty? That's a way to use essays, but make sure that you're weaving in the actual purpose of writing the essay, which is learning the content. 
Um, I think I said quiz people or quiz students on their own paper. Do you remember the main points? What are the sources? What are the factual questions about your subject? Can you remember the opening paragraph or the body or the conclusion? So quiz them on that. And that you are saying um, so many of these, our schools have an advantage because they're smaller, right? Well, if you think about a large public institution trying to trying to do this, the thing that, that I'm concerned about, so think about the larger classes, 400 students are in this uh, class and, and you can't really deliver this, that kind of personal, I'm, I'm, I have a suspicion that you were using chat GBT, whatever, GPT. And um, so I need to, I need to do a oral exam and right. quiz you about this, right? Well, that's really hard to do at a, like a freshman level, uh, large course yeah. at a large institution. And what's worrisome for me is, is you might be able to do that when they get into their major at a, so they're, when they're juniors or seniors, but at that time, by that point, these students have been not learning for two years. They've just right. been using AI. So, so that's concerning and absolutely smaller schools have an advantage here because yeah. you have faculty who are engaging the student kind of that, that is already kind of woven into the teaching process that we're going to have more one-on-one -on -one or, or um, the ability for me to spend time and talking with you. Yeah, so. like what you said about oral exams, that is one of the faculty said, if I suspect that this was AI gen generated, I'm going to throw it away and we're gonna have an oral exam right there. But that is yeah. a high touch practice, right? Okay, the last one that I wanna talk about is critical thinking. If I'm using AI as a tool, put in your prompt, create an outline, put in your prompts, have a beginning piece on your paper, then I think you go through and you say to students, first of all, is it true? Is what this AI is telling you true? And the only way that you can know that is you have to go do research in order to know it's true because we know it's iffy, right? It's like not really that interested in being correct. Then the next question I think is, is that a great response? Like, how would you make that better? What is missing from this response? Don't focus so much on the facts, but think more about the application, about how to draw that out and have more context or add to it, I think is really important. Um, and then also, I had this experience where I was, as I was playing with this AI, I said, using, send an email using belonging cues to a student that is struggling, right? I told you that. Yeah. And I got back this response that was like so angry. It was like, you're doing a terrible job and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, wait, let me assess my prompt, right? This is critical thinking. Let me assess my prompt. Okay. I need to put in not, do not use shaming language. I want the voice of a coach. I want the, um, assumption that the student can recover and be successful in the class, right? So I had to do this process of, I just threw out a prompt. I didn't get back what I wanted. And so I was like, Rachel, drill How would I do this? what you yeah. want to do, right? Yeah. That's super helpful for students to do. If they get the wrong thing and you say, how would you make that prompt better? That is a great process for them in that critical thinking uh, thought, right? So I would just say, I think this is going to be evolving. I think there's a lot more conversation that we're going to have. But the idea that we cannot stem the tide of technology, it is coming. And I would just be so curious. You guys ask your students about it. They think that we have no idea about it. Right. Um, and so I think it would just be a really interesting reflection of tell me how you're how you've used it and what you think about it and how are your friends talking about it and it is an introduction to a really great conversation about technology, I think, for our students. I mentioned it at dinner and my uh, high schooler, her head shot up like, how's he know about this stuff already? <laughs> this was back in December. <clears throat> like, yeah, let's not pretend it doesn't exist. How do we leverage it? Keeping in mind all of these concerns, yeah. right? So sure. that you laid out, but how can we, how can we best use this? as a teaching tool, I think there's a lot of uh, potential there. And man, my business and professional writing class would have been so, <laughs> so much better. No, easier. I don't know. Yeah, something. It would have been different. That's it, for sure. It would have been different. 
All right, you guys. To, you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sticking with me as I downloaded my brain to you. Feel a little bit of relief that I have given that all to you. And I know we're going to have more conversations, but grateful for your time. Thanks for joining us. We look forward to our next time together. Well, thanks, Rachel. Yeah, thanks. Bye.